Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Gresham College and this event uh, being held under our long finance program. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the Emeritus Professors of Commerce uh, and a fellow trustee at Gresham College. And it really is a delight to welcome you to a symposium that's been going on uh, in our minds for some time. This afternoon, we're going to try and look through the ghosts of scandals past, present, and future to see what lessons we can learn and whether we can assess which is rosier, the future of finance or of financial scandals. I first proposed such a, a symposium for the city back before 2000. My thinking then was that people in the city often fail to see that, uh, at least uh, the way the news portrays things, that folks outside in the country, that's uh, beyond the circle line for the likes of me, uh, might conclude that the city was a place where some scheme to relieve the naive bumpkin of his or her money was unmasked about every six months. In the late 1990s, though, I was assured that under our benign regulation, all of my historical examples were irrelevant. And then alongside the biggest bubble up till that time, the dot-com, during which I wrote a slightly prescient piece, how I learned to start worrying and love the dot-bomb, came the supposedly impossible onslaught of waste management, Enron, Global Crossing, WorldCom, uh, Sunbeam, Dinergy, Nikor, Halliburton, and Arthur Anderson went down. But Arthur Anderson looked a sacrificial lamb uh, as the authorities shored up the four remaining audit firms who managed on their own to produce Adelphia, Freddie Mac, Duke Energy, Kmart, Homestore.com, HealthSouth, Imclone, Nortel, and AIG, round one. And that was all before 2003. And it wouldn't happen in Europe, well, except for Parmalat and many others. Scandals are certainly not new. From this dictionary definition of scandal, you can see that the Greeks had their scandalons. And in the program listing, we point to a long litany of great and unending financial scandals, and we skipped the Egyptian, Greco-Roman, Chinese, and medieval scandals. And since we put the uh, symposium in the program, LIBOR and missold interest rate swaps certainly feature. The global financial crises since 2007 seem to regurgitate numerous scandals, and just our UK domestic financial market conveniently uh, thrusts a few new scandals into the limelight every six months or so. Now, I anticipate much discussion today about whether a scandal is only a scandal when laws are broken. That is, yesterday's scandal becomes outlawed or outregulated and becomes tomorrow's criminal prosecution. Or whether scandal embraces both legal and illegal manipulation. Or if only illegal operations constitute a proper scandal. Further, I anticipate a lot of discussion about whether or not professionals are able to defend their dishonors with an appeal to the legality of their past actions, think no further than the accounting and law firm's defenses in 2010 on Repo 105 and Lehman Brothers. Just doing my job. Or are, as professionals, they, and perhaps their institutes, uh, should be held responsible to wider society. They should demonstrate a global understanding of the nature of the system of knowledge and proficiency, that is, ethics, Kasher. Or in Balzac's words, and you don't want my French, but with Tim here I have to try, le secret des grandes fortunes sans cause apparente est un crime, crime oublié. The secret of great fortunes without apparent cause is a crime forgotten, for it was properly done. Now, it will be a boring afternoon if people stand here like preachers, reciting lists of sins and transgressions. We are here to analyze, discuss, and learn. We structured this afternoon around past, present, and future, the ghosts in Dickens' Christmas Carol, and I have assembled three appropriate ghosts to carry us through that tale. Aldous Huxley said the charm of history and its enigmatic lesson consist in the fact that from age to age, nothing changes, and yet everything is completely different. Dickens himself covers financial scandals we would recognize today in Little Dorrit and Nicholas Nickleby. Yet, I have to confess to symposium misselling. The title of this symposium is a scandal. The phrase, what the Dickens, is not about Dickens. Dickens is a euphemism for devil. Quick evidence predating Dickens himself, Shakespeare's Merry Wives of Windsor, I cannot tell what the Dickens his name is. 
But why should Long Finance and Gresham College be interested in financial scandals? Well, simply because they seem to be an enduring feature of finance. Well before Shakespeare, our founder and Dickens, uh, Sir Thomas Gresham, was no stranger to rigging markets. Having cornered the Antwerp-based market for Tudor debt at several points, he writes to Lord Cecil in 1558, as for example, did I not raise in King Edward's time when I began this practice was but 16 shillings. Did I not raise it to 23 shillings and paid his whole debts after 20 shillings and 22 shillings, whereby wool fell in price from 20 sh six, sh six shillings, eight pence to 16 shillings and cloths uh, from 40 pounds a pack to 40 and uh, 35 uh, a pack with all our other commodities and foreigners, whereby a number of clothiers gave over the making of monies of cloth, making of cloths and jerseys. So he's describing an absolutely brilliant scandal he'd pulled off on the markets to reduce the cost of the king's debt. So if we are working towards a, financial, a working financial system, I feel it is only right that we should look at where it seems to break down. Now, in my few minutes, what I would like to do is point out some previous ground that is often covered when people discuss scandals, and I'd like to suggest that this afternoon we act like detectives and consider motive, means, and opportunity, as well as what we might do about them. First, on motive, I don't think uh, we shall have to look hard or dwell too long, as this 2012 year-end cover of The Economist shows. We shall see some base human nature, greed and fear, power and sex, and all of the seven deadly sins. But suggestions uh, for single phrase causes and solutions on motives tend to include blaming things on capitalism, psychopathic chief executives high on testosterone, class structure, bad culture, incompetent professional oversight, corruption, divisions between blue collar and white collar crime. And these lead to single phrase solutions that include better regulation or better supervision or better control, controlling bonuses, ethical training, government ownership, and many of the suggestions verge on the religious. Culture change seems a religion. We had a bad culture, but we've now redoubled our efforts towards a good one. And as one colleague commented to me just this week from within a major global bank, he's heard the culture change statements from the top, but a couple of years on, his day-to-day -day environment hasn't changed a whit. Financial services regulation also seems a religion. Regulation failed because you didn't really, really, really believe in regulation, so pray harder. This is a strange con contrast, almost a reversal, from the German, Vertrauen ist gut, Kontrolle ist besser. Second, we will touch, I think, on means this afternoon. In 2008, I gave a lecture on the surefire of five ways to make money, uh, which ranged from Ponzi schemes and friends I've known to agency problems, information asymmetries, externalities, luck, and crime. We concluded that the one guaranteed to make money, way to make money is to convince people that you have a surefire way to make money. Unfortunately, if you have self-esteem, you are likely to be hoist on an intelligence versus integrity seesaw. The second best way to make money is to ride a bubble and get off in time, but you have to be intelligent at guessing what other people will desire. In short, Leading people into scams is dishonest, but successfully predicting where people will go constitutes honest investment winnings. And finally, if people are really going to go ahead and trade with each other anyway, find a way to own the casino. And perhaps that is the surest way to make money. Third, opportunity. It's probably the hardest area for us, but I would like to point, I think, really to two general conditions that we might consider, bubbles and oligopolies. Galbraith believed that far more important than the rate of interest and the supply of credit is the mood. Speculation on a large scale requires a pervasive sense of confidence and optimism and conviction that ordinary people were meant to be rich. People must also have faith in the good intentions and even in the benevolence of others, for it is by the agency of others that they will get rich. So if we want good times, we need some bubbles. But can we even tell we're in one? This is a current debate, uh, and uh, I'm in the midst of a survey which is testing Alan Greenspan's contention that you can't spot a bubble when you're in it. This is too complicated. Nobody can really understand if it's a bubble. 
And then there are the tides. John F. Kennedy first coined, a rising tide lifts all boats, to which Warren Buffett, in his Berkshire Hathaway chairman's letter of 2001, added, after all, you only find out who is swimming naked when the tide goes out. So scandals are revealed when the tide goes out, when the bubble bursts. Well, we held a long finance conference in 2011 on bubbles. There, John Redwood pointed out that he could show you an economy with fewer no bubbles if you wanted to see what one looked like before you pricked them all. That economy? North Korea. So we could eliminate scandal by eliminating bubbles. Perhaps we could have a scandal-free economy, but would it be one that we'd really like to occupy? Well, eliminating speculation may be difficult, if not impossible. Baudelaire, no fan of commerce at all, concluded that for the merchant, even honesty is a financial speculation. And Nate Silver, in his recent book, The Signal and the Noise, relates, for Sennett and others who take highly mathematical views of the market, the presence of periodic bubbles seems more or less inevitable, an intrinsic property of the system. But still, uh, there are some proponents of the efficient market hypothesis who continue to resist the notion of bubbles. Fama, in what was otherwise a friendly conversation, recoiled uh, when Silver so much as mentioned the B word. That term has totally lost its meaning. A bubble is something that has a predictable ending. If you can't tell you're in a bubble, it's not a bubble. I anticipate again that today we will be trying to distinguish investing from trading and trading from arbitrage, as well as speculation from gambling and tackling thoughts on what might constitute intrinsic value. But as I've pointed out to folks before, one can't tell the difference between investing and gambling. You say your shares are an investment. I say I can't tell them uh, the difference from a gamble. Perhaps horse racers love love gambling because their efforts result in investment in courses and bloodstock. I really can't tell the difference. Your intentions matter, sure, but only you know them. And I'll close on bubbles with uh, Warren Buffett, but a pin lies in wait for every bubble, and when the two eventually meet, a new wave of investors learn some very old lessons. First, many in Wall Street, a community in which quality control is not prized, will sell investors anything they will buy. And second, speculation is most dangerous when it looks easiest. Oligopolies are tough, though, to analyze. Uh, Gresham and other tutors knew a surefire way to make money, get a monopoly. And monopolies or oligopolies are either awarded or tolerated by government, and the interaction between government and oligopolies frequently involves corruption. By the end of the 17th century, the Dutch quipped that the initials of their East India Company, a monopoly, the VOC, stood for Fergan onder corruptie, i.e. perished by corruption. And I echoed Balzac earlier this week on the nefarious British East India Company, behind every famous name lies infamy. Macaulay writes about the East India Company in 1841, stating the business of a servant of the company was simply to wring out of the natives a hundred or two hundred thousand pounds as speedily as possible that he might return home before his constitution had suffered from the heat to marry a peer's daughter, to buy ro rotten boroughs in Cornwall, and to give balls in St. James's Square. And there were numerous elements of corruption from bribery of officials and politicians to share manipulation to insider trading. The companies knew that keeping their oligopolies was the source of their excellent returns and were prepared to share some of their rents to perpetuate them but perpetuation required government to override competition. Which leads nicely on to monetary scandals. The Swedish, Dutch, and British East India companies all intertwined with bank scandals. The collapse of Bank of Amsterdam in 1770, the Bank of Air in the UK in 1772, etc. Some would argue that all systemic financial scandals are the result of a general loss of confidence in banks and debt and created uh, by overly loose credit. In the end, it's about confidence in cash. Since the creation of central banks in the 1600s, governments hold very special monopolies on fiat currency. Certainly over the past 400 years, the very biggest scandals have been associated with some form of credit bubble. Or a 
credit bubbles themselves the scandals? Is there a classification of oligopolistic scandals, lots of private sector abuses in rigged energy or commodity markets or investment markets, and a few mega monopoly scandals where governments abuse the whole monetary system? So today, perhaps you can reflect on motive, means, and opportunity, and whether the two conditions for great scandals are speculative bubbles and government-created credit bubbles. Now, today's program, as I said, is very much around past, present, and future, and our, our three ghosts, um, Edward, Mike, and Brandon. And we're going to have a, a quite a, a lengthy discussion after the break, so it will be both uh, Edward and Mike, and then we'll have a short 15-minute leg-stretching break, and then coming back here at 3.30 for Brandon's presentation, and then Tim will lead us through a, a fairly solid discussion um, for an hour um, which is, I think, the purpose of any symposium. And before I uh, sit down, I'd just like to leave the final word, if I may, to Warren Buffett. Long ago, Sir Isaac Newton gave us three laws of motion, which were the work of genius. But Sir Isaac's talents didn't extend to investing. He lost a bundle in the South Sea bubble, explaining later, I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not the madness of men. If he had not been traumatized by this loss, Sir Isaac might well have gone on to discover the fourth law of motion. For investors as a whole, returns decrease as motion increases. I'd like to hand over to Ed, if I may. Thank you very much.